All right, everyone, I am super excited today because I have a special guest on my channel. His name's Nick Wignall, and he has a blog that I read all the time. And every time I read it, I learn something new. So I think you guys are really going to love him because the way he teaches and the way he explains concepts is very um, orderly and it gives you really actionable steps. So hi, Nick. Thank you so much for um, joining my channel, for being willing to spend some time with us today. Yeah, you um, bet. Thanks for having me. Anna. Yeah, really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about how we talk to ourselves and how we treat ourselves and some ways we can improve that to, to do a little bit better. So, okay, well, let's talk about self-talk, right? Um, let's do it. What, what is self-talk? How would you describe, like, what is self-talk? Um, yeah, so in some ways, I think you don't want to get too complicated with it. Um, it's just the way you talk to yourself in your head. Like we all talk to ourselves. Um, I think some of us are more or less aware of how much we talk to ourselves and sort of the quality of that speech. But I think, I think all of us kind of understand that like thoughts kind of run through your mind. Um, the kind of two ways I like to think about it, there's two different ways I like to approach this. Um, one is to think about it like <clears throat> you just like you have different ways of talking to different people in your life, you know? So like I, <laughs> I talk to my old rugby buddies from college in a very different way than I talk to my grandmother, right? <laughs> like, um, it's, it's just a different kind of style. I have like a different uh, approach to talking and we tend to talk about different things. Um, so the way I talk to certain people is gonna be a little bit different than the way I talk to other people. And, and so one way you, you can think about self-talk is just like you have a certain style or approach to talking with different people in your life, um, most of us have a certain style of talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one way of looking at self-talk. So yeah. what are some of the common patterns you see with your clients of people, like how they talk to themselves, uh, mm -hmm. both like harmful ways or potentially some you know, helpful ways? Yeah, so I think it's, again, it's important to answer, I wanna start this kind of answer by reminding everyone of there, there are different styles of communicating and it's not that one or one or the other is bad or good right they're just better or worse or more helpful in different situations and with different people so right. we can think about the same thing with ourselves with our self-talk and the what happens when people get into trouble with self-talk is when their self-talk gets really stuck they get stuck in a certain style of talking to themselves or about things that happen um, and they can't shift ears to introduce a new metaphor here. <laughs> yeah. um, so like a, a really common one, for instance, is um, so one like um, technically they're called cognitive distortions, but they're, they're style, they're ways of thinking about things that are either inaccurate or kind of unhelpful. And so um, one of them is called fortune telling, right? And fortune telling is when you are basically predicting the future. Now, the ability to predict the future is it can be a really great thing, our ability to kind of imagine like what's gonna happen in the future, obviously super important. Like I'm glad we can do that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But we, we do that well when there's some data or evidence for what's gonna happen in the future. When, you, when you're reasoning based on real kind of data or, or evidence or yeah, whatnot. But when you're doing that, when you're just um, catastrophizing, for instance, you're just going straight to the worst case scenario, right? without yeah. any reason for going there. You, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a mental habit you can get into. You can just get into the habit of immediately start starting to tell yourself, oh, this terrible thing is gonna happen, dot, 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 dot. And then kind of going down that like rabbit hole. Um, another yeah, one- this is never one, gonna work. I'm gonna fail college. Um, no one's gonna like me. Um, you know, things like that, right? Exactly. Not only is it inaccurate, right? When you're kind of making assumptions about the future, but you don't actually have any evidence or data for that, but it's, it's just not especially helpful, right? So that's, that's one of them. Um, mind reading is another one where, again, there's a useful version of this where I'm kind of listening to you and I'm inferring from your facial expression that like, all right, Nick, like this is getting pretty boring. Like, let's move on to the next thing. Like, that's good that I can kind of read you, right? And get a sense for yeah, maybe yeah. what you're thinking. Um, like, like but, all of these things could have a function when they're used in the right time, right? Like, so mind reading, like trying to empathize or understand what someone else is thinking can help you be a little bit more in tune to them, but then, exactly. and then it can go wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, but if you, if you do that constantly, like, and you do it without any sort of real evidence, 
Um, if I'm just making up stories in my mind about what you're thinking of what I'm talking about, that can start to be really unhelpful. It can start to lead to a lot of unnecessary anxiety, stress, frustration, anger, whatever it is. Um, so I think the, the first kind of takeaway, I think when it comes to self-talk is just to realize there are different like styles of mm -hmm. thinking, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes you're gonna be really kind of jokey or even sarcastic, right? Sometimes you're gonna be really empathetic and supportive. Sometimes you're gonna be really intellectual. Sometimes you're gonna be really pragmatic. None of these are good or bad, right? But they're different styles of thinking. And just like you can have different styles of thinking about the world and what's happening, you can have different styles of thinking about yourself and talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so first of all, it's just important to be aware of that and to ask yourself, do I tend to get really stuck in one particular style? Like, do I tend to personalize? That's another one, right? Whenever something bad happens and something, you know, someone critiques my work, I, I instantly go from, you know, they didn't like the presentation to they think I'm a terrible employee, right? Or instead of like, yeah, I put my foot in my mouth and said that kind of insensitive thing and they didn't like that, it's they think I'm a terrible person or like, or I'm, I'm an awful husband or spouse or something like that. Right? Yeah, and yeah. So, so you take like a little mistake or you take a little flaw or some piece of criticism and you, you turn this into your identity, right? You're like, oh, I yes. am a terrible mother instead of, oh, I just did that thing that wasn't great. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm a terrible mother, right? Right. And, yeah. and these things are all, we oftentimes we can kind of see them after the fact. If someone points out, you know, the next day, like, mm, you kind of like jump into conclusions there or like maybe you're kind of projecting out into the future and there's not a lot of good reason. You can, after the fact, you can step back and go like, oh yeah, okay, there wasn't a whole lot of evidence for that. Or I know I'm not a terrible person just because I made one mistake. The, the trick though is to be able to see it in the moment. And this is where it's, it's really hard to be able to move out of that narrator voice and see yourself like you would the author, to be able to see both the narrator and the character um, mm -hmm. and to take a more kind of balanced um, perspective on things. And it's, it's just really hard and it takes a lot of practice um, to be able to do that. But before you can even start to work on that, you have to start thinking about self-talk more generally and these yeah. different styles. That's why we have these, these little like names like fortune telling or mind reading or personalizing or um, emotional reasoning. or like, There's all these different labels because the label, when you have a word for something, it's easier to think about it. Right? If, you don't have a, if you don't have language for something, you're just not going to think about it. Right? right. But once you have a word for it, you're gonna go, oh wait, hey, I'm doing that thing, right? I'm mind yeah. reading, I'm like projecting into, and so having a word allows us to have more awareness. And yeah, when you have so, more awareness, you can catch it. Okay, so, so giving it a name creates more awareness. And when you have awareness, then you can start catching it. And if not right in the moment, you can start catching it after, even mm -hmm. like not even until your next therapy session, the next time you sit down and journal, yep. then gradually you can bring that closer and closer to that event when you're doing it. And then hopefully, catch yourself right before you do it <laughs> and say, oh, exactly. is this what I want to do? Is this how I want to talk to myself, right? Yeah. And if you think about it, that's how any process of skill acquisition works. It's always yeah. like slow and awkward at first. And you're only catching stuff after, you know, if you think about like practicing scales on the piano or swinging a golf club or um, baking something, I don't know, whatever it is, you always yeah. feel slow. Like you always feel like you're playing catch up. Yeah. But if you stick with it, it gets a little bit faster and you get more and more to the point where you can notice it in the moment. So I, I was trying to remind people, even if you're, even if you're getting frustrated because you're catching it later after the fact, that's okay. That's normal in every area of life. This is how we learn, right? We're slow and it takes yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, so don't give up just because you, you don't catch it in the moment. That's not bad. That's not a bad sign. That's totally normal. You're like all of us, like trying to learn anything. Right. And so that's yeah. good. If, even if you can't catch it until your next therapy session or a couple hours afterwards, that's fine. The more you catch it um, a day later, the easier it's going to be to catch it an hour later. And the more you catch it an hour later, the more you're going to catch it, you know, five minutes later. And pretty soon you'll start to be able to catch it more in the moment, which is really the sweet spot, because if you can catch it in the moment, you can actually influence it and go a different direction. Right. right. Which is the, that's the holy grail. Like that's what we all want to get to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we do that? Right. So if we've got this habitual pattern. We've been doing it maybe our whole lives. Maybe we were spoken to this way as kids. Right. Like our parents maybe said, oh, sure. you're a failure. You're an idiot or you're going to fail or stop that. You're so stupid or, you know, labeling or this yep. talk. And then we develop this habit of internal self-talk and that we're trying to change it. This is like 
like bushwhacking neural pathways. That's like combining <laughs> a couple of things, but right, like we can change our brain, but it takes yep. a while to beat these new pathways into our brain, right? So how do we do right. that? How do we start changing our self-talk? So first thing you mentioned is like get a name for it, find yep. out a name, learn about these cognitive distortions, um, mm -hmm. and then start being aware of them, start noticing them. And then if you can catch them soon enough, you can rewrite them, right? Exactly. Yep. The, the kind of next like intermediary step there is starting to be aware, not just of these patterns of thinking, these distortions, but triggers, right? Certain oh, yeah. things in your environment, certain people, certain ways of talking, mm -hmm. um, certain things that happen to you are going to be especially triggering of certain patterns of self-talk. So yeah. if you can anticipate those triggers, you're going to be much more likely to catch them. Like if you just know that, um, you know, on like Thursday afternoons, like my boss is always super stressed because of some meeting she has, and she's just more likely to kind of say something biting or insensitive. If you know that going into your Thursday meeting with her, it's not going to surprise you. And so you're not going to be as flustered. If you see it coming, it's a lot easier to, to anticipate it and to deal with it well. That makes so much, that, that's such an uh, important thing to remember because I forget about that a lot, like this triggers thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe as, as a woman, I can say this, but like, I think it's important to track your periods because right before your period, that is when my negative oh, self-talk yeah. is like, oh my gosh, Emma, you are a terrible human being. And if I right. can be like, oh, this is probably at that point in my cycle, I'm right. just going to ignore that until I feel better. <laughs> I talk about it with my female clients all the time, actually, that comes up yeah. a lot. Um, so it's super, super common. And that's that's just as meaningful a trigger as, as anything else. So that's, so if you've done kind of those, like I, first of all, identify, know that like, hey, self-talk is a thing. I tend to talk to myself sometimes. It's not always super helpful. There are these specific modes of talking to myself, right? And I, if I can give those a name, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, there goes my mind reading, right? Or, oh, there goes my labeling, whatever it is. Yep. You can catch it more easily. If you're aware of the kinds of triggers, like situations in your environment or your life or certain people where those unhelpful styles of thinking are more common, you can anticipate them, right? Which yeah. makes you, you can adapt better. You can be a little bit faster instead of being kind of behind the curve all the time. Yeah. Then I think the, the next step is to, you, to realize just because a thought is the first one that comes into my mind, that doesn't give it any like special value. Just because it's first doesn't mean it's more correct or that I should think more about it. Or like, it's just the first one. It's just the first one that happened to show up. Mm -hmm. So that is super, super important because if you can do that, if you can recognize like, okay, it's the first one and not give any special priority to it, it opens the door to the most, in some ways what's the most important step, which is generating alternatives alternative stories for what something means, right? So yeah. I lose my temper and like raise my voice at my daughter, right? Something like that. If my first thought is like, God, you're a terrible dad. Like she's gonna end up in therapy for the rest of her life because you're awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> if that's my first thought and I just assume, okay, that's true. Well, now that's gonna lead me down this very unhelpful path of thinking, which is like, oh, I'm a terrible dad. Like all this stuff is gonna go bad, like blah, 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 blah. And then of course I'm gonna feel awful. Yep. I'm not gonna be able to help the situation like my daughter, because right. I'm feeling so bad, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I can catch that initial thought and say, okay, wait, wait a second here. Like, really? Like you're a terrible dad because God forbid you lost your temper once and raised your voice a little bit. I don't think so. Like the action was not helpful, right? But yeah. that does not invalidate me as a person or as a parent, right? So mm -hmm. an, another sort of story or way of looking at that, well, one is exactly what I said. Like just because one specific action does not define me as a person, right? Yeah. Or I might say something like, you know, I, I regret doing that, but, you know, all parents lose their cool sometimes. Um, it doesn't, you know, like it happens to everybody. Right. That, that would be another sort of interpretation of things like it's not that abnormal. Right. Yeah. Um, or or even another one might be like, you know what, like I I don't like that I sort of yelled at my daughter, but actually it's important for her to see that if she does certain things right that aren't that are against the rules or that are, if she's like mean to her sister. Right. That has consequences like people like it's OK for her to see me getting angry sometimes in response to what she does. That in yeah. itself is not. So these are all examples of different stories, or if you, if you prefer, sort of 
different theories for what something means. Yeah, I love that because not only are we questioning a little bit our thinking and that we can we can put out five or six alternative ways of, of describing or making stories about what happened, but then we can ask ourselves which one's true and which one's helpful. And I think sometimes when someone's like really depressed or really anxious, asking that first question can be hard, which one's true? Like someone who's really depressed, like, is it true that you're a terrible, horrible, hopeless human being? And they'll be like, well, I think so. <laughs> but if you ask, <laughs> is it helpful to believe that you're a terrible human being? Does that help you get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. No, that does not help, right? So, so asking either of those questions can help people like challenge their thinking and take something like a little bit more action, right? Yep. Good yeah, I, I, I like to tell people, if you're struggling with that, if you're like, well, I just can't think of anything that's more true or, or that's more helpful, mm. doesn't matter. Literally anything is better than just having one story and going yep. with it. Even if the other things you generate are completely bonkers and off yep. the wall, right? That's at least a step in the right direction. You're getting a little bit more flexible with your thinking. And mm -hmm. that's really important because how we feel emotionally flows directly from how we think. And in particular, how we talk to ourselves. So if you're stuck in one particular way of talking to yourself, that's really unhelpful and, and overly negative, for instance, mm -hmm. you're going to be stuck feeling that way. And your only hope of getting out of that is if you can flex things, if you can get a little bit more flexible, right? Yeah. The other kind of, I would say maybe third approach to negative self-talk, which is you don't have to challenge it or even develop um, sort of alternative theories. And you don't necessarily just have to redirect and think about something else. The other thing you can do is what we sort of, therapists and mental health professionals call self-compassion, yeah. which I have mixed feelings about because I, I love the idea of self-compassion. It's super important. I feel like the phrase turns a lot of people off. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm going to try and explain it in a very straightforward way, okay. which is when we're struggling, we feel bad for something, say we're worried about something. Most of us, I think our self-talk tends to be pretty intense is the word. It tends to be a little harsh, um, often judgmental. If you were to kind of describe like the quality of your inner narrator, I think words like that would come up a lot. Like we're very tough on ourselves in a oh, lot yeah. of ways. Oh yeah. I think most people are a lot harder on themselves than on anyone else in their lives. Well, and that's the big irony, right? Like we're so hard on ourselves and yet like in the next breath, we can be amazingly like compassionate and empathetic and supportive when like our best friend who's struggling with the exact same thing right. comes to us. Like we're, we're like this model of empathy and support for this other person in our life. And, and we're, we're, uh, we're just like awful to ourselves, right? We're super harsh and critical and judgmental. Yeah. So this idea of self-compassion, that sounds fancy. All it means is learning to treat yourself like you would treat a friend who is struggling. So when you're struggling, right? just applying the same, not having a double standard, applying the same standard of support and empathy that you would apply to someone else who you cared about and learning to apply that to yourself and that that's totally okay. And actually, turns out, secret, it works a lot better <laughs> than being super hard on yourself. <laughs> um, and so, what I, but at the end of the day, what I tell people is, don't take my word for it, just experiment with it a little bit. Yeah. For a week, Try treating yourself when you struggle like you would treat a friend. If, if it doesn't work or it leads you to becoming a completely irresponsible, terrible person, fine, give it up. You don't have to stick with it, <laughs> right? right? But just try it out for like a week and see what happens. Yeah. Right? I just encourage people to experiment with treating yourself the way you would treat a good friend. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that ends up being a really powerful, in the long run, a really powerful antidote to this problem of, overly harsh, negative, judgmental self-talk. Mm -hmm. And that takes us like right back to the beginning, right? You're talking about this is like almost like a relationship, right? You talk to your buddies in one way, you talk to your grandma in another way. How we talk to ourselves changes how we feel. And it really impacts our emotions. And if we can be a little bit flexible and be a little bit curious and maybe experiment with some different ways of talking to ourselves, try it for a week, right? Try being gentle to yourself like you would be with a friend. And see if that you know impacts how you feel, impacts how you act, makes your life a little bit better. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's it's really about relationships. You just uh, you do what you would do with any important relationship in your life. Like, why not foster that same kind of relationship with yourself? 
I, I think totally. is, is the way to, to look at this. Um, totally. and, and I think it ends up being the most helpful in the long run. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Is there anything else you want to share as we wrap this up? It, actually, it's something you mentioned. I think maybe a good place to end is this idea that if you tend to be really harsh and judgmental with yourself, a, another option is you can be curious with yourself. Like when you notice yourself feeling angry, right? Or um, overly personalizing something, you can step back and instead of saying like, oh yeah, I must be terrible. Or I can't believe I'm thinking like that. Like what an awful way of thinking. You, you, there's this middle ground of just like, oh, like that's interesting that that would be my first response, huh? And when you, when you, if you can approach things with that attitude of curiosity, almost always it will open up many more doors and more helpful sort of ways to proceed. In my experience, it sounds like you Yeah, yeah. Same, like but. it just creates space, right? Like just being curious about what you're doing creates space. And when we have that space, like change suddenly has options, right? We have the yes. option to change. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Love it. Well, cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day, your busy schedule to um, talk to us. And I think I think my audience is going to love geeking out on all this self-talk stuff. So, uh, Awesome. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really appreciate it.